ASOSU Bill 72.02, better known as the Ticket Bill, was passed by the ASOSU House and Senate last night. We spoke with Speaker of the House Jacob Van Dever for his thoughts on the bill. And today the annual engineering career fair was held on the CH2M Alumni Center. Both local and national companies came out to see what OSU students had to offer. Finally, Phi Delta Theta's philanthropy hits home as they raise money for one of their fellow brothers struck with leukemia. We'll have this and more on tonight's episode of the Beaver News. Good evening and welcome to your Thursday night edition of the Beaver News. I'm Joe Hedberg. And I'm Cody Stover. We're glad you could join us tonight. Last night, ASOSU's fourth meeting of the Senate saw the second round of the Ticket Act discussions about the use of town hall meetings with the student body and the hat-trick vote courting options. Before getting to the Ticket Act, two bills were brought forth for the first reading, SB 7202 and SB 7203. After light discussion on the matter, Senator Tyler Hogan tabled the bill with concern that students may not be included in the conversation in future discussions of the issue. The amendment passed in the House and Senate. Our own news director, Hayden Smith, went out into the field to talk with ASOSU Speaker of the House, Jacob Vandiver, for a follow-up on the night's action. Yeah, um, well, I'm Jacob Vandiver, and I'm the ASOSU Speaker of the House. Here. But, uh, yeah, the ticket bill passed, and essentially what it's saying is, um, but what the executive branch wants is to not have their staff in charge of policing students on the lines. It's one of those things where, you know, they're not trained, they have, you know, lives, they can't spend their uh, Sunday nights, you know, early Monday mornings policing students, and that's pitting students against students. And ASOSU's stance was essentially, you know, athletic department, you know, this is, this is your thing, uh, we would like to see you police it, but we are here to listen to you and be able to give student input, and that's what we are able to do. So, if, you know, if there's issues there, um, I'm sure their first step would just be to go back to the table with uh, the athletic department, sit down, have a talk with them. And, you know, if, it, if it's decided that ASOSU should play a bigger role, then that's definitely a possibility that another resolution should come out. I, it's one of those things with demand for tickets at what it is. Right. There's going to be problems no matter what happens, and all we can really do is lessen harm. As long as everyone who camps out is able to get a ticket, you know, that's great. I mean, obviously, people who show up first deserve to get the better seats and the better tickets. I mean, that's just the only way to really measure the utility of receiving those good tickets. But there's some other issues with like people drinking and fires during the campouts. We want to kind of minimize that as much as we can. But yeah, I think I think the proposal will be good. And if it's war if more actions warranted later, we can take into that. Yeah, have you guys ever thought about selling tickets online? Or? Yeah, um, I know some people really like that idea. Um, some people don't because it turns into one of those things where it's really more like a lottery where everyone you know logs on at 12 o'clock, clicks a button, and right. you know, if you're lucky enough to get in, doesn't get in. Um, I, I know it's something being talked about, and I know some students really like it, some students really don't, so I guess we're kind of open to those conversations. I could see like a certain amount being put aside for online for you know people you know with disabilities who can't you know camp out people who have to take care of children who can't camp out things like that allowing them to do it but I think the camping out is a great way to measure the utility of you know who wants the tickets the most I think as long as it's one of those things where the maximum people can camp out is 24 hours and you don't have people skipping class to camp out and get tickets um, I think it's probably one of the better ways to do things plus the camping out culture is kind of fun but as long as as long as it's safe it's one of those things that Student needs to be aware of that if there are big issues and like if you know there's a lot of drinking, if there's a fire, if there's violence, or if anything gets out of hand, camping out will get shut down like that and we'll be much more likely to see an online system. Securing a job after graduation can be tough in present economic times, but Oregon State Career Services is helping students connect with potential employers. The two-day Oregon State Fall Career Fair concluded today, but not after giving students the opportunity to network with nearly a hundred companies. The fair took place at the LaSalle Stewart Center from 1 to 4 p.m. with Wednesday's fair pertaining to all majors at OSU and Thursday's fair catering specifically to engineering students. Big names such as Boeing, DuPont, HP, and Intel highlighted the event as well as many other local and non-local corporations. If you missed this week's fair, don't worry. Oregon State Career Services hosts similar fairs in winter and spring terms and as always provides students with resume help, career advice, and informational career-related seminars. The Career Service Office is open Monday to Friday 8 to 5 and is located in room B008 in Kerr Administration Building. 
Oregon State University Cascades launched the 2012-2013 academic year with an anticipated enrollment of just over 1,000 students, including 237 students taking lower level courses at Central Oregon Community College in preparation for transferring to OSU Cascades. According to the OSU Cascades webpage, this reflects an overall enrollment increase of 9.7% and a 37% increase in freshmen and sophomores. 30% of the student body is new to OSU Cascades this fall. OSU Cascades continues to draw students primarily from Central Oregon and 18 other states. The percentage of male students increased slightly to 42% of the student body. Women comprised about 70% of the student population through 2010. Greek life philanthropies are common, but Phi Delta Thetas hits close to home. The fraternity is putting on a fundraising campaign for one of their own members, Matt Fettig, who was diagnosed with leukemia this past August. The Phi Delts campaign titled Fight for Matt, or as their shirts say, Frat for Matt, are selling t-shirts, wristbands, and accepting donations to help fund Matt's treatment. I spoke with members of Phi Delta Theta today and was informed that Matt's leukemia is currently in remission, which is good news, but that his chemo treatments will continue, and thus, so will his medical bills. The Phi Delta Thetas also told me that Fight for Matt has drawn some national attention among other Phi Delta Theta fraternities, as chapters from University of Oklahoma, University of Oregon, Washington State, and University of Puget Sound all have shown support. The Fight for Matt booth will be in the quad tomorrow, and on Saturday, the fraternity will host a walkathon, with the proceeds from the event going to Matt's family to help cover medical fees. The walkathon will start 11 a.m. Saturday morning at the Phi Delta Theta House on Monroe. The entry fee is $5, but helping a fellow beaver in need is truly priceless. We spoke with a Phi Delta representative for the inside look at the booth. I'm Patrick Jordan. I'm from Phi Delta Theta, and uh, this is our philanthropy here called Fight for Matt. Um, one of our brothers in the fraternity, Matt Fettig, was diagnosed with leukemia this summer, and so we're here out in the quad raising money for him, selling these wristbands uh, that say Fight for Matt and for the courageous and uh, just raising money to help him and his family. I think it's great that other universities are pitching in to help out. Yeah, a lot of times we get so caught up in sports and that kind of stuff that we think universities are pitted against each other, but something like this with Matt's situation brings everyone together for a common cause. That's really great. Yeah, I have to agree. Yeah. Members of the Oregon State University sororities and volunteers with the Corvallis Fire Department will be going door-to-door -door Saturday in neighborhoods surrounding the OSU campus to check resident smoke alarms. We talked with Fire Prevention Officer Jim Patton of the Corvallis Fire Department who told us that the campaign is being conducted as part of National Fire Safety Month. Student representatives for the Fire Department will patrol the neighborho neighborhoods from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. with replacement batteries for smoke alarms that need them and smoke alarms for homes that are without them. The students plan to visit more than 500 dwellings and to test more than 200 smoke alarms. If I told you that football popularity has been on the rise at Oregon State, you'd probably think of Oregon State's 6-0 football team. But today, I'm talking about another kind of football on campus, rugby. The originally British sport is available to Oregon State students through multiple outlets, including the collegiate-level Oregon State Rugby Club team, Rec Sports Intramural Rugby, and a rugby pack class offered in the Oregon State curriculum. The Beaver Club team went undefeated last year and are the reigning Northwest Collegiate Rugby Conference champions. They currently are in the preseason, but have a match this Saturday at PV Field against a team of alumni players. For those who are interested in rugby but are new to the game, registration is open at Dixon Rec Center for less experienced players who would like to play intramural rugby. So get ready to scrum, because rugby at Oregon State is here to stay. The most compelling aspects of a university for many people are its athletic programs that create a focus around which the university and surrounding communities rally. OSU Cascades has taken the first step in developing a club sports program that will compete with other colleges and universities by signing an agreement with the Mount Bachelor Sports Education Foundation. The teams may begin as early as this fall. A task force helped select the sports to fit with the region's ready-made training venues and community support for these popular outdoor activities. For the ski teams, Mount Bachelor is 22 miles from the campus and provides the highest skiable elevation in Oregon and Washington. Westminster House, part of the Oregon State Spiritual Life community, has been shaking things up the past few weeks and plans to continue to do so in the following weeks of fall term. 
The Christian Social Group is hosting a series of what they like to call Conversations with Interfaith Neighbors. These conversations take place on Wednesday nights and feature guest speakers from other Oregon State religious groups. An Islamic student joined the conversation a couple weeks back, and last night a Buddhist speaker was featured. The conversations will continue with a student from the Baha'i faith scheduled for the new near future. These discussions are open to the public, and Westminster House hopes that they will increase awareness and understanding between spiritual groups on campus. According to a recent study here at OSU, more than 40% of older breast cancer survivors are insufficiently active after leaving a supervised program. But new research shows that those women who develop behavioral skills such as self-confidence and motivation during their program were far more likely to continue exercising on their own. Regular exercise may reduce the risk of breast cancer recurrence and breast cancer related mortality, experts say, making it crucial to effectively target breast cancer survivors who do not engage in regular physical activity for interventions. Researchers at OSU partnered with researchers at Oregon Health and Science University who had conducted a clinical trial to understand the benefits of a 12-month supervised exercise program in 69 or older breast cancer survivors. The researchers said everything should meet physical activity guidelines and it can even be more crucial for breast cancer survivors. The weekend before Halloween is here, and while you're out enjoying the festivities, some deep thinking will be taking place on campus. The 64th annual Northwest Philosophy Conference begins tomorrow starting at 1 o'clock and runs through Saturday. The conference welcomes philosophers from all over the United States and Canada to come together and share ideas. Over 70 presentations will be given during the two-day conference, highlighted by keynote speaker, author, radio host, and award-winning lecturer, Dr. John Perry of the University of California, Riverside. Presentations will take place in Strang Agriculture Hall and the Memorial Union until they conclude at 6 p.m. Saturday evening. In sporting news, we wish good luck to Sean Mannion, who resumes the role as the starting quarterback for the men's football team. Mannion missed two weeks because he was recovering from a surgery due to a meniscus injury he sustained while playing a home game against the Washington State Cougars. The Beavers will take on the University of Washington Huskies this Saturday at CenturyLink Field in Seattle. If you are going up, drive safely and go Beavers. Five weeks into fall term, the Oregon State Organic Growers Club is thriving again. OSU's Organic Growers Club has been around for over a decade and is completely run by students and volunteers. The club held a workday session this evening on their two-acre farm near the intersection of Highway 34 and Electric Road. The Organic Growers Club always welcomes new members and has workdays every Thursday. It's a great way for students who wish to work with soils and agriculture and experience green thumbs to gain valuable hands-on experience. Oregon State University Women's Center and Women's Studies program marked its 40th anniversary with a ceremony held Tuesday on the second floor of Reeser Stadium. 100 people looked on while a handful of faculty members from the past and present spoke about the history of the program and its development over the years. Janet Lee, a professor and former director of women's studies at OSU, was one of the four speakers who remarked on the significant work done by the late Jeanne Dost, who founded and directed the program. Beth Wrightvelt, the director of women's, the Women's Center, discussed the events and the people who aided in the center's advancement. If you're taking your lunch break in the Memorial Union tomorrow, prepare to be welcomed by the sound of music. And no, I'm not talking about the melodic chords of a music major who stops by the lounge to riff on the grand piano between classes, although that is a good guess. Halcyon Trio Oregon, an all-female music group featuring singer, trumpeter, and a pianist, will be performing tomorrow in the MU Lounge at 12 noon. Their performance is part of the Music a la Carte Friday Music Series put on by the Oregon State Music Department. Halcyon Trio Oregon will perform free of charge from 12 to 1 tomorrow in the MU Lounge and all are invited to stop by and listen. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Have a good evening. I'm Joe Hedberg. And I'm Cody Stover. Oh, I completely biffed that end right there.